Silicon Valley banks collapse, rippling into China. Thousands of Chinese companies are listed among the bank's clients, with over 240 million in assets on the line, and 57 are on a special list belonging to the Chinese Communist Party. Those same companies fall under the foreign depositors category that the U.S. is set to protect. Senator Marco Rubio penning a letter to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, expressing concern over handouts to the Chinese regime. What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, has put an unlikely sector in the spotlight, China's startup industry. But is the U.S. about to step in? During a Senate Finance Committee hearing on Thursday, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen confirmed that foreign clients will also be protected. Uninsured investors will be made whole in that bank, and I suppose that could include foreign, inv foreign depositors, but I don't believe there's any legal basis to discriminate among uninsured. I get it, but I, I'm just saying. Now, Chinese companies are among those foreign depositors the U.S. is set to protect. SVB's list includes thousands of Chinese companies, the biggest ones being drug makers, with over $240 million in assets in the bank. That's including companies with ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Among the Chinese companies listed, 57 are on a special list of the CCP. These are considered elite entities in the fields of artificial intelligence, digital tech, medicine and health. They get strong support from Chinese authorities in terms of finance, resources and more. Following Yellen's comment, some Republicans are raising concerns. That's around handing payouts to Chinese investors and companies. Senator Marco Rubio said in a letter to Yellen that, quote, hostile foreign adversaries must not benefit from SVB's collapse, adding the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. must work diligently to ensure that promising American firms working in critical technologies do not end up acquired by Chinese conglomerates and others. It's estimated that the bank had nearly $14 billion of uninsured foreign deposits. Now, why are so many Chinese startups affected? That has to do with the Chinese regime's regulatory restrictions on foreign ownership. That's when SVB stepped in. Starting in 1999, SVB was one of the first financial institutions to start serving Chinese startups. The bank established a Beijing office to offer advisory services and client support. Fast forward to 2019, SVB Chief Credit Officer Dave Jones said in an interview, quote, we're a model bank for China. He went on to lead the bank's China operations. In addition, Silicon Valley Bank also provided a variety of convenient functions, fast becoming the first choice for Chinese entrepreneurs. Following the collapse, some of the biggest Chinese startups affected are in the biotech sphere. That's including Bygene, one of China's largest cancer-focused drug makers. It said it had more than $175 million in uninsured cash deposits at SVB. Biotech company Brebio and pharmaceutical firm Zilab also got hit. Chinese investors, businesses and regulators hope to mitigate the damage following SVB's collapse. Reuters noting a Chinese state-owned newspaper saying in an editorial this week that SVB's failure would have important implications for the development of China's small and medium-sized lenders and the stability of China's financial system. A multi-billion dollar enterprise with bloodshed hidden behind the scenes. The Chinese regime's forced organ harvesting has been denounced as a tool of genocide. Now, a witness tells how Chinese police and hospitals have colluded on such atrocities. Once the police got the body, they sold the organs to hospitals. That was the source of the kidney. In the summer of 1991, Guo Hong, a Christian, met an organ recipient at a hospital in the eastern coastal city of Qingdao. The patient, a man suffering from uremia, was scuttled for a kidney transplant the next day. Guo learned that the new kidney would come from a death row inmate to be executed the same day. The patient's wife told me that by then, the police authorities had already performed blood tests on the death row prisoner, and results showed they were a kidney match. 
Despite all this, the family of the executed man appeared unaware that parts of their loved one's body were sold in secret. Authorities refused to let the inmate's father collect the body, saying he didn't have the required paperwork. With this, the police could classify the body as abandoned and keep it for their gruesome business. They also charged additional fees to those receiving the organs. I also saw the patient's wife wrapping cash and paper for the police. The doctor asked her to give money directly to the public security officers. It all took place even before China established a voluntary organ donation system, and Beijing only admitted to removing organs from executed prisoners after 2005, claiming to have gained their consent. Human rights groups have railed against such practices, noting the inmates' inability to give free consent. Guo's account adds to the mounting evidence tied to the Chinese communist regime's forced and systematic trade in organ harvesting. In 2019, a London-based tribunal convicted the CCP of murdering prisoners of conscience on a significant scale for decades. The victims were mainly followers of the spiritual practice Falun Gong. Since 1999, millions of practitioners have been cast into detention, many of them tortured to death. Risking retribution from the CCP, Guo chose to speak out about what he called horrific atrocities, drawing courage from his own faith. There were so many Falun Gong practitioners who were subjected to the illegal practice of forced organ harvesting in China. That was against humanity. I hope more people could be aware of it, especially those who had similar experiences as mine or had knowledge of the matter. I appeal to you to speak out. I believe evil will never beat good. I believe God will give us wisdom and safety. The White House demanding TikTok's Chinese owners give up their stake in the company, or else the social media app could face a full ban on U.S. soil. The ultimatum would become the most dramatic in a series of steps by U.S. officials. They've raised fears that TikTok's data on American users could be passed on to the Chinese regime. Owned by Chinese developer ByteDance, TikTok has more than 100 million U.S. users. Former President Trump had tried to ban TikTok in 2020, but was blocked by the courts. The Wall Street Journal reports that global investors own 60 percent of ByteDance shares. The remaining stake is split between its founders and employees. Beijing's foreign ministry was quick to respond, accusing the U.S. on Friday of using data security concerns to block Chinese companies and adding that Washington had yet to give evidence that TikTok threatened national security. ByteDance has spent more than $13 million on lobbying since 2019 and has hired several dozen lobbyists. And now people with knowledge of the situation say the app is bringing in even more support, reportedly hiring top Biden-connected consulting firm SKDK. The public affairs and political consulting firm is providing communication support to the company. It's seen as the most well-connected Democratic firm in Washington, with former top employees in senior and mid-level roles in the Biden administration. All of that in an attempt to mitigate federal action against TikTok. But the app is facing challenges outside of the U.S. too. We're making the decision that uh, for government uh, employees, for government equipment, um, it is better uh, to not have them access TikTok uh, because of the concerns uh, that people have in terms of safety. That's Canada's approach, citing the app presents an unacceptable level of risk to privacy and security. Likewise, New Zealand said Friday it would ban TikTok on devices with access to the country's parliamentary network. And a day earlier on Thursday, Britain announced it would immediately bar the app from government devices. Likewise, Belgium and the European Commission have already done so. More U.S. weapons for Australia, all for boosting its defense capabilities in the Indo-Pacific. The U.S. State Department approved sales of cruise missiles to Australia on Thursday. The deal valued up to $895 million. It came just days after Australia agreed to buy nuclear-powered submarines from the U.S. Senior U.S. Admiral John Aquilino said that Washington has no intention of angering China, only to maintain stability within the region. The United States is not seeking conflict in the Indo-Pacific region. 
Rather, we embrace the rules-based international order, freedom of navigation throughout the global commons, human rights, and the peaceful settlement of disputes utilizing the rule of law. Aquilino is in charge of the U.S. military in the Indo-Pacific. China, on the other hand, condemned the U.S. for its involvement, accusing it of what Beijing officials described as severely damaging regional peace and stability. On Thursday, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, addressed how more countries in the region are shoring up alliances. That's in response to Chinese aggression. He explained if China wasn't in a confrontation with India twice on the border or the Philippines twice with the Coast Guard or shooting missiles into Japan's exclusive economic zone, nobody would be like this. The U.S. has recognized the strategic importance of the Indo-Pacific for years. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin labeled the Chinese regime's increasing aggression a generational challenge earlier this month. A turning point in Japan and South Korean relations, one that could reshape the power dynamic in Northeast Asia. Despite deep historical wounds in their bilateral ties, the two countries are vowing to deepen military and economic cooperation in the face of common foes, North Korea and China. Here's more. Leaders of Japan and South Korea met on Thursday in a historic moment because it's the first time that a South Korean president has visited Japan in 12 years. The two countries, both allies of the U.S. but with centuries of animosity between them, are increasingly being driven closer together by China's growing presence in world affairs and mutual security threats such as North Korea. Underlining that subject, North Korea launched another long-range ballistic missile that landed in the sea between the three countries just hours before President Yoon Suk-yeol arrived in Japan. This video released by Japan's defense ministry is believed to show the missile's contrail. Yoon and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida hashed out several new agreements in the visit, including tightening intelligence sharing and ending an almost four-year dispute over raw materials used in high-tech equipment. The visit also came in the middle of joint military drills between South Korea and American forces. The U.S. commending an icebreaker between South Korea and Japan. The two U.S. allies have been long at odds over their history as enemies during World War II. Uh, this uh, partnership, we believe, is key to upholding and advancing our shared vision for a safer, more secure, and more prosperous Indo-Pacific. The U.S. ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, says the warming relations could also help the U.S. That's because the Chinese Communist Party often seeks to drive wedges between American allies. He added that part of China's entire strategy is division. Reacting to the news, Beijing's foreign ministry said it opposes efforts to set up what it called exclusionary cliques. Japan and South Korea pledged to boost intelligence sharing about North Korea's movements. Both sides have also taken a step back to soften relations. Japan saying it would loosen restrictions on certain chemical exports to South Korea, needed for semiconductor manufacturing. As for South Korea, President Yoon arranged for a fund to compensate Koreans who worked as forced laborers in Japan during World War II. This relates to one of the biggest disputes between the two countries. South Korea has been demanding Japan pay the laborers, but Tokyo said a 1965 treaty had settled the issue. The U.S. now helping West Africa counter China's illegal fishing. For the first time, Washington is conducting maritime drills with West African forces. That says deterring illegal fishing from Chinese vessels has become a top priority. The U.S. commander in charge of the training says the practice robs the region of a key resource and takes food out of people's mouths. He adds that it also fuels other criminal activity, including the drug trade and human trafficking. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has more. West African forces pull their small boats up to a rust-stained ferry and swarm the deck to disarm mock kidnappers on board. The drills are meant to bolster the skills of West African forces. Admiral Milton Sands says the program has expanded to help coastal nations in the region cope with maritime threats such as piracy and illegal fishing. Piracy, a real issue in the Gulf of Guinea. Another one is illegal, unregulated and unauthorized fishing. 
According to a 2022 report by the Financial Transparency Coalition of Non-Governmental Organizations, illegal fishing is sapping an estimated $9 billion a year or more through illicit financial flows. Of the top 10 companies found to be fishing illegally in the region, eight are Chinese and a third of all vessels sport Chinese flags. It actually pulls resources, food, from the mouths of our partners in coastal West Africa. And then there's a variety of other threats, criminal threats, uh, human trafficking, drugs, other things that are coming in through the maritime environment. Around 350 troops took part in the drills, including servicemen from Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Nigeria on the Gulf of Guinea. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Fighting on two fronts, with Russia in Europe and China in Asia. But what can the U.S. really afford? Can the U.S. actually win two wars on two different fronts right now, or do we need the help of allies? Well, we could if we started a crash program to manufacture the correct weapons. These weapons, in my opinion, have to be tactical nuclear weapons, especially tactical nuclear artillery. Rick Fisher, senior fellow of the International Assessment and Strategy Center, breaks it down. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.